speaker, uh, Dr. Molly Schumer, who comes to us from Stanford Uni University, where she's a brand new assistant professor. She's been there since August. Uh, Molly earned her under did her undergraduate work at Reed College, uh, and then applied to graduate school at a place called uh, UC Berkeley, uh, <laughs> uh, but ended up going to uh, to Princeton, uh, where she worked with Peter Andalfato. Uh, on not on Drosophila, but on a sword tail a fish, uh, in collaboration with Gil Rosenthal. Uh, and I, this is when I first became aware of Molly because I was surprised to see papers on fish coming out of Peter Andalfato's lab, uh, who I'd always thought of as a Drosophila uh, evolutionary geneticist. Uh, but she uh, had a remarkably successful graduate career and then went on uh, to do a postdoc uh, with. Uh, Molly Przorski and, and, and then at Columbia and then David Reich uh, uh, at Harvard before joining the faculty at Stanford. And I was talking with her this morning and she actually got her position at Stanford uh, fully two years before she took it. Uh, and so she was able to defer for a long time and remain as a postdoc. And I think she uh, agrees with me in thinking that this is the best time in anybody's career is when you're a postdoc and you have a, jo a great job waiting, waiting for you. And she certainly made, made the, the most of it. So I was excited when I learned she was coming to Stanford because she's uh, now a near neighbor. And I hope that uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, interaction uh, going, going forward. Uh, Molly is interested in hybridization uh, and has done beautiful work on fish uh, in natural populations, so she's done field work and she's also done uh, uh, experiments in, in the lab, uh, looking, uh, among other things, at uh, linkage disequilibrium between unlinked markers and hybrid populations between different species as a way of identifying genetic incompatibilities. And this has been a very uh, fruitful area of, of research. Uh, she's also published uh, um, theoretical models uh, on the formation of species through hybridization. Uh, so she's not only an empiricist, but has, has done some very original thinking uh, on a problem that really many people have thought about for many years. And so I've been very impressed with her, her originality in bringing sort of fresh thinking to, to an old problem in evolutionary <coughs> biology. She's published papers in uh, PLOS Genetics, uh, eLife, PNAS, uh, Science, she had a lovely paper in Science last year, which uh, to my knowledge is the only paper that uh, looks at empirical hybridization in both fish and humans. Maybe I'm wrong, but uh, there aren't many papers that combine fish and humans. They're not hybrids between fish and humans. Uh, so it's, it's my great uh, pleasure to have Molly here to speak to me today. Please join me in welcoming her. One last uh, comment is that uh, she's also been invited by uh, the computational biology program here and will be giving another seminar tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, in Lee Cushing. Uh, so from 2 to 3 tomorrow. Thanks, Michael, for the introduction and the invitation. Um, I'm really excited to be able to meet with a lot of you throughout the day today. Um, so, um, my lab works on understanding the evolutionary causes and consequences of hybridization between species. And this has been a really interesting area to work on, especially over the past several years, because I think as a community, our views about the frequency and importance of hybridization have really changed dramatically with the advent of inexpensive whole genome sequences that allow us to look at a lot more broadly at species across the tree of life. Um, so just to illustrate how much our view as a community has changed, um, I have this quote from Ari Fisher from 1930, um, where he wrote that <laughs> hybridization is the grossest blunder in sexual preference which we can conceive of an animal making. Um, and this reflects the, the view in the community for several decades. Um, and the reason he said this is that hybrids suffer very real fitness consequences. Um, they can be less viable or less fertile than either parental species. Um, they can have a whole sort of range of challenges if, if they have traits mismatch their ecological environments. And they can also have difficulty finding mates if they have sort of the wrong combination of behaviors, preferences, or sexual signals. Um, but despite these many disadvantages that hybrids face, 
um, we see evidence of hybridization everywhere. And so I'm highlighting here just a handful of examples from diverse groups of species um, where um, hybridization has been described between close relatives relatively recently. Um, so I think this really brings up a, a big challenge as we sort of go into the, um, the sort of new world of, of genome sequencing and trying to understand evolutionary patterns in the genome, um, where you know, many groups of species have a substantial degree of hybrid ancestry, and we need to now understand what that's doing in the genome, how it's impacting the evolution uh, at the genomic and population level. Um, and this sort of um, pattern of, of rampant hybridization is, is evident in the species group that I've chosen to focus on uh, as a model, which is the sword-tailed fish. Um, and these, um, this is actually a figure from my first uh, dissertation project um, looking at this group um, where we were trying to reconstruct the phylogenetic relationships between species and also understand patterns of gene flow. <laughs> Um, and what, um, so this was an RNA-seq based project using a couple thousand gene trees. Um, and what we saw um, in, um, in these analyses was really sort of rampant evidence for gene flow throughout the phylogeny, both at historical and recent time scales. Such that um, of many of the, the modern species that we study now in, in the lab, um, large proportions of their genomes, upwards of 10%, were derived from past hybridization. So this really raises the question of you know, how um, these, these hybridization-derived regions function in the genome. And I think some of the um, you know, most uh, foundational work on this has been actually done um, in our own species. Um, so humans um, admix with Neanderthals and Anisovans and possibly other archaic hominins as we spread out of Africa and around the globe. Um, and um, this was some of the first work to look at variation in ancestry locally in the genome on, on a genome-wide scale. And I think it's shaped a lot of, of the thinking about this problem. Um, so one of the, the exciting things that come out of this work is that even though particular populations have sort of uniform mixture proportions, so they, um, so for example, Europeans um, on average derive about 2% of their genome from Neanderthals, um, and there's low variation in that, that mixture proportion, um, there's very non-random um, distributions of where in the genome that ancestry <coughs> is. Um, so there are sort of large swaths of the genome um, where Neanderthal ancestry or Denisovan ancestry is completely gone. Um, and so this suggests that there's, you know, on the one hand, this um, admixture that's prevalent um, but on the other hand, some strong filters on, on where that can persist. Um, and um, this work on, on um, Neanderthal and human admixture um, also sort of delved into some of the annotations that are available for the human genome and was able to show that um, there's not only these sort of big deserts of Neanderthal ancestry, but they're also associated with particular things in the human genome. Um, so, in particular, regions of the genome that have um, very high density of, of functional base pairs are particularly low in Neanderthal ancestry, suggesting some kind of purging that removes that ancestry from these regions. Um, and in particular, in this case of admixture, there's been a lot of discussion about what the possible causes of that are. Um, so I'm going to walk you through some of those. Um, so some of the initial ideas about what might be causing these patterns in the, in the human genome is this idea of hybrid incompatibility, which we're very familiar with as evolutionary biologists. So um, the basic idea behind um, the theory is that you have this ancestral population. It subdivides into daughter populations that accumulate new mutations. Some of these mutations will fix. And because these mutations are fixing within population, that means that they're either neutral or possibly advantageous in popu within population. But then when these species come back together and hybridize, you have these negative interactions. Um, and so the idea was that perhaps the locations of these negative interactions in admixture event would sort of remodel where ancestry was tolerated from uh, minor parental species. Um, um, so this is, is one possibility for patterning of ancestry in the genome, 
another possibility, which is um, in part um, proposed from, from work that's come out of Berkeley, um, is this um, idea that the demographic history of the hybridizing populations can have a really big impact on what happens after admixture. Um, so in particular, we know that um, Neanderthals had a very strong bottleneck, um, which reduced their population size such that they couldn't purge deleterious mutations that would have been effectively purged within the larger human population. So then, when humans and Neanderthals admix, um, <coughs> Neanderthal haplotypes carried all of these sort of deleterious, problematic um, mutations. And so that's another possible genetic source of these kinds of um, forms of selection on hybrids. Um, so today, I'm going to tell you about our work in a system where I think we can really nicely sort of tease apart um, some of, of the different uh, mechanisms causing selection on hybrids at both sort of a local scale within the genome and at a population-wide level. Um, and this is a, has been a really excellent system because it's amenable, as, as Michael alluded to, both to these natural populations um, in the field that we can study um, and um, lab populations and, um, and sort of classical genetics, which, which gives us a lot of power to ask some of these questions. Um, so much of our empirical work focuses on two particular hybridizing species of swordtail fish. Um, this is Xiphophorus malinche, uh, which is a high elevation species, and Xiphophorus birchmi, which is a low elevation species. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, and these species hybridize at intermediate elevations. Um, as you can see, they're, they're quite morphologically divergent. Um, and genome-wide, they have about a half a percent sequence divergence. Um, so to give you a, a sense of the ecological scale over which these species are found, um, Malinche is a high elevation species, um, so it's found at sort of the, um, uh, these high elevation <coughs> cold um, sources of the rivers. Um, and by contrast, um, birch and I is found at low elevations in much shallower, <coughs> warmer, um, uh, broader pools. And um, hybrids we find over a whole range of <coughs> intermediate elevations, and we've done some uh, fine scale sampling across the cline in, in a couple of rivers. Um, so all of these are, are really interesting features of, of this hybridization system, and there's a whole lot that I haven't even mentioned about sexual selection in hybrids, um, which I think is really exciting. Um, but what drew me to this system and, um, and motivated me to develop it as a genomic model for hybridization is that we have this um, really unique setup um, where we actually have replicate hybrid populations between the parental species. So the distribution of species is such that um, Malinche is found at, found at high elevations and Birch is found at low elevations, and they independently feed into different tributaries. And so the hybrid populations that form at intermediate elevations are actually geographically isolated from each other, even though they're formed from similar parental populations. And so this is um, a really um, exciting opportunity for people interested in kind of the, um, how the genome evolves after hybridization because it allows us to ask, you know, what kinds of, of outcomes of hybridization do we see um, not only in one population but in each of our three hybrid populations. Um, and, uh, and then sort of by contrast, what sorts of outcomes seem to be more population um, or environmentally specific. So um, for all of the, the, these questions and, and the um, results that I'm going to tell you about today, um, we rely really heavily on local ancestry inference in hybrids. Um, so um, I'm just going to walk you briefly through this approach, but I'm happy to talk in more detail if people are interested. Um, so basically, um, what we do is we collect <coughs> Um, high coverage whole genome sequence data from the parental populations. We have about 60 genomes from three different parental populations for the birch and I, and um, uh, two different parental populations for Malinche. Um, and we um, identify ancestry informative sites that are fixed differences between those species um, so that we don't see as variable in any of our population panels. Um, and then for our hybrids, then we just collect a fin clip, and we put those individuals back in their rivers, um, and they, um, we, we capture a lot of them, so they seem to do fine. Um, and we collect low coverage, about 1x whole genome sequence data. Um, and then we take that data, and um, 
we map it to both the Malinche and Birchmanai genomes. And then we count the number of reads in that low coverage data um, that at each site match a fixed difference between Birchmanai and Malinche. So that gives us sort of a matrix of counts for each individual. Um, and then we apply a hidden Markov model only on those fixed ancestry informative sites to infer local ancestry along the chromosome. So what I'm showing you here is an example from our Tatamako hybrid population. Um, and you can see these regions that are shaded in blue are homozygous Birchnine for ancestry. The regions in red are homozygous Malinche. And then the regions um, that are unshaded are um, high confidence heterozygous, so having a haplotype from both Birchnine and Malinche. And so this gives us information at sort of individual regions in individual hybrids, but it also gives us genome-wide information. Um, so some of the, the things that we've learned about these populations has been just sort of looking at this genome-wide ancestry data. Um, so one of the sort of first observations um, was that there's a huge variation in population structure across these different hybrid populations. Um, so on the one hand, we have um, this, this Chotonikapa population. It has about 80% of its genome for birch night. There's some amount of variation in ancestry across individuals. Um, and sort of on the other extreme, we have a population where individuals derive the majority, about 75% of their genome from Malinche, and there's, again, fairly low variation in ancestry. Um, and then we have this, um, this population that we've puzzled about a lot, where we actually have this bimodal ancestry structure. So we have two subpopulations. One is um, very close to Malinche, the um, upriver parent in its ancestry. And one looks more like this Tony Kappa population, where it derives the majority of its genomoid ancestry from birch Um I'm going to uh, return to the cause of this, this population structure um, at the end of, of my talk. Um, but for now, um, we're just going to focus on these admixed populations, um, where we have a, a big chunk of the genome derived from um, one of the parental species. And what I want you to notice here is that we actually um, have this sort of nice natural replication in the setup where we have these two populations that derive the majority of their genome from the birch my parental species, and then another population where the majority of the genome comes from the Malinche parent. And that allows us to sort of ask what kinds of patterns are sort of independent of, of what species you get the majority of your genome from, but seem to be sort of predictable based on this majority and minority ancestry breakdown. Okay, another um, really useful and cool thing that we can do with this kind of local ancestry data is ask about the time scale of hybridization. Um, so in um, a first generation hybrid, you have a whole chromosome from parent species one and a whole chromosome from parent species two. So the length of your ancestry tracks are the whole chromosome. Um, as additional generations of recombination occur, um, you begin to break down those, uh, those ancestry tracks. And so over time, you can actually use um, information about the length of these ancestry tracks or the decay of admixture linkage disequilibrium to provide a rough date for when a hybrid population may have initially formed. And so we um, uh, applied this early on to our hybrid populations. And at the time when we did these analyses in 2014, um, for all of the populations we collected, we got estimates for the age of the populations ranging from about 30 to 100 generations. And so this suggests that in these particular hybrid populations, hybridization began very recently. So our tails have about two generations a year. Um, and this was really exciting to me, given my interest in hybrid incompatibilities, um, because it suggested that hybrids might sort of still be in the process of resolving these conflicts that are um, generated by combining these parental genomes. Because if you wait long enough, you expect that these, um, these sort of conflicts will, will be resolved um, in, in terms of fixing ancestry for one species or the other. Um, so we set out to try to understand whether we could use our hybrid populations to identify some of some candidates for, for incompatible interactions between these the, these two genomes. And so the, the basic <coughs> approach that, that we took um, in sort of generating a large candidate set um, was based on this idea 
that in a hybrid population, if you have incompatible loci, there will be sort of missing genotypes. So to walk you through that, um, if you have a hybrid incompatibility between being <coughs> homozygous parent one at locus one and homozygous parent two at locus two, um, if it's still segregated in the population, you should see this sort of um, missing combination of those two genotypes compared to what you would expect given the ancestry frequency at these two loci. And so um, we basically took the approach of, of trying to scan for these kinds of interactions <coughs> genome-wide. But of course, as, as many of you may know, there are lots of potential confounders, including population structure, um, demographic history, that can generate these correlations in a way um, that doesn't have anything to do with hybrid incompatibilities. Um, so the way that, that we approach this um, in our initial work was to, to um, require that these missing genotype combinations be identified not just in one hybrid population, but in each of our hybrid populations. And so that this could give us a set of sort of repeatable missing genotype combinations to use as our candidate set of hybrid incompatibilities. Um, and so applying these scans to, to each of our three hybrid populations, um, we identified a large number of sites. In our latest analysis, that includes all three populations and several hundred individuals from each population. Um, we have on the order about 100 pairs of sites that show these kinds of patterns. Um, so this is a, a really big number, and I think it was shocking to us and to other people um, that the genome is sort of spotted with, with these kinds of sites. Um, so one of the, um, so, so um, tomorrow I'll talk about work we are doing to try to fine map and understand the phenotypes that are associated with some of these incompatibilities. Um, but one of the first things we did was to try to understand if these sites appear to be behaving like we expected hybrid incompatibilities to behave. Um, so one of the strong predictions of, of models of hybrid incompatibilities is that um, these sites will fix for one ancestry or the other. And the direction in which they fix will depend on the ancestry of the population. Um, but what's shared um, is that you'll always fix for the major parental ancestry um, at incompatibility loci. So you have this sort of bias towards shifting towards the major ancestry at these kinds of sites. And so we can ask in our hybrid populations whether we see this pattern. And so what I'm showing you here is average ancestry at this um, set of candidate incompatibilities in each of our three hybrid populations compared to batch sets from the genomic background. Um, and one of the things that we see is that um, minor ancestry, so ancestry from that minority parental species, is consistently lower at these sites than at other regions of the genome. Um, and we've done a bunch of simulations to evaluate this and, and make sure that this is not an expectation from the way that we ascertain these sites or the way that we scan for them. Um, so this is exciting and suggests that these sites are, are being sort of pushed down in minor parent ancestry over time. Um, but one of the things that we're actively working on in the lab um, is actually tracking these sites through time. Um, so we have now two full time series data sets spanning about 20 to 30 generations in two of our hybrid populations. And this data has actually been sort of um, both exciting and difficult to analyze because, you know, as you go through time, you, you change the linkage structure of these ancestry tracks. Um, so you may have sort of both shifting re, um, linkage structure and shifting selection coefficients um, through time. Um, but our preliminary analyses um, have indicated that a subset of these loci um, do shift in frequency in the way that we would expect. Um, and, um, and the overlap between loci that shift and these putative incompatibility set is highly non-random. They're very enriched for frequency changes. Um, and that of those... Um, candidate incompatibilities that change in frequency over time, the vast majority change in the direction we would expect, where they're losing minority ancestry. Um, and we do see a couple of exceptions to that, but, um, but it's a really overwhelming pattern, not only in our incompatibility set, but genome-wide. 
Okay, so um, I've sort of summarized a, a lot of work that we've done over the years trying to understand um, you know, where in the genome these incompatibilities might be, um, how they're changing an ancestry and remodeling the um, ancestry of, of regions around them. Um, and in doing all of this work, I um, started to sort of think of the, the landscape of selection in a hybrid genome and how these sort of dense sites under selection um, might sort of interplay with other processes going on in the genome, um, which is what led me to uh, my interest in understanding the interplay between hybridization and the local recombination rate and how that sort of shapes selection on hybrids. Um, so the basic idea here is that um, when you have mixture between um, a majority ancestry and a minority ancestry, like we have in the sortal populations and like we see in many hybrid populations, um, that minority ancestry is more likely to harbor mutations that have a negative interaction with something elsewhere in the genome um, because most of the genome comes from this other ancestry. Um, and so this means um, that if these blue haplotypes are going to persist, they need to become unlinked from any linked incompatibilities. And so um, this leads to an expectation that there's going to be a strong dependence on recombination rate in terms of where these haplotypes are maintained. Um, so, um, just to walk you through this intuition, in regions of the genome that have high recombination rates, where recombination events are common, you're much more likely to introduce these recombination breakpoints that will allow these minor ancestry tracks to be <coughs> obtained. In contrast, in regions of the genome with low recombination, recombination events are rare, and you're unlikely to break down that linkage to a, a, a deleterious or incompatible site. And so this leads to the expectation that after selection, um, regions with low recombination rate will have retained or will have purged much of their minor parent ancestry, whereas regions with higher recombination rates may have been able to maintain um, some of their minor parent ancestry. And so we can look at this, um, this is very intuitive, but we can look at this formally in simulations. So if you take a um, recombination map and you randomly lay down hybrid incompatibilities, you allow admixture and selection to occur, you see exactly this dynamic emerging, where regions of the genome with low recombination rate have lower minor parent ancestry, and regions of the genome with high recombination rates have retained more minor parent ancestry. And so it's nice to see this in simulations, but obviously we want to look at it in, in real data. Um, and so we have these sort of rich data sets for ancestry information across the genome in sword tail hybrids, but we lacked a recombination map. Um, and so for this project, we generated a few different recombination maps. The one that I'm going to talk about today um, is this uh, population-based map. So there's a natural relationship between um, linkage disequilibrium between SNPs and the uh, recombination rate between them. And we can use population genetic methods to infer the local recombination rate. This gives us high <coughs> resolution estimates of recombination rate. In the case of the sword tail genome, estimates at about 10 kb resolution throughout the genome. Um, we have looked at um, ancestry based and crossover based maps and shown that they're concordant with the predictions of these population maps. So we can combine this fine scale recombination map with ancestry data from each of our hybrid populations. And again, leveraging the fact that we have these replicate populations. And so I'm going to just jump into the results here. Um, if we look at the relationship between ancestry and recombination rate in population one, um, this is what it looks like. So just like in the simulations, um, we see this sort of deficit of minor parent ancestry, which in this case is Malinche ancestry, in low recombination rate regions of the genome, and um, more retention of minor parent ancestry in higher recombination rate regions of the genome. Um, shifting to population two, we see the same pattern. And in population three, we also see this pattern. And this is quite um, <coughs> exciting for us because population three is actually this this flipped ancestry population. So instead of getting the majority of its genome from Birkenstein, it gets the majority from Malinche. Um, and so um, this suggests that this sort of 
the relationship between recombination rate and ancestry, which we believe to be driven by selection, is, um, is not dependent on um, which parent is the major parent, um, which could suggest that there's some sort of um, just global selection against Bollinger or Bershman ancestry, but is actually sort of a, a more specific prediction of, um, of models of selection against hybrid incompatibilities. <coughs> So seeing these patterns, I became um, really interested in how general they were. Um, and so at the time, there, there weren't that many fine scale recombination rates um, available um, for species that also had local ancestry data. So um, as Michael mentioned in, in his introduction, we, we chose to compare some of these patterns um, to the admixture events between humans and Neanderthals and humans and Denise events. And those were two different admixture events. And so when we do this, um, we actually see a very strikingly similar pattern where regions of the human genome with low recombination rates have retained uh, less Neanderthal ancestry, and regions of the genome with higher recombination rates have more Neanderthal ancestry. Um, and then shifting to a, a, a second admixture event that occurred in, in oceanic human populations with the Denise events, we again see this pattern and perhaps more strongly. Um, and so um, I do want to emphasize here that the sources of selection are likely quite different in these two admixture events, um, but I think this highlights sort of a fundamental <coughs> interaction between um, the local recombination landscape and how selection occurs on hybrids. Um, and so we're really excited about this idea that you know, in these three replicant hybrid populations of swordtail fish, we see this really predictable and consistent relationship between recombination rate and ancestry. Again, we believe this to be driven by selection on hybrid incompatibilities. Um, and then we also see this kind of relationship in really different admixture events um, between really different groups of species. Um, and I think, um, you know, again, that the sources of selection are likely different, um, but trying to understand sort of the fundamental genetic mechanisms that mediate selection on hybrids is going to be very important going forward um, as we sort of realize that more of the genomes we study are indeed admixed. Um, and of course, um, it's been really exciting um, to see other work coming out on this. So I do want to mention mm -hmm. that um, uh, some of the original ideas for these kinds of patterns came from, um, from earlier studies in mice and rabbits. And um, we have seen, since we published our paper, a really nice study come out in Heliconius showing exactly these same patterns in hybridizing Heliconius species. Um, and um, we've uh, gotten our hands on some, some hybrid data between domestic cats and servals, um, which are about 10 million years diverged. And, um, and there are late generation hybrids between them because people like how cute they are. Um, and um, we actually see this, this pattern emerges very quickly in those pedigrees. So um, it's something that, that is laid down in early generations. Um, so trying to think about these, these commonalities between species is really one of the big motivations of work in my lab. And I think there are hints that, you know, besides your combination rate, there are obviously other factors that really matter, like the density of functionally important base pairs, Obviously, that's seen in the, the human case and has re, uh, received a lot of attention. Um, but we also see that in sore tails, and it's been seen in, in um, sort of myriad other hybridization systems. Um, so the first part of my talk, I've really focused on, on trying to tell you what we know about the genetic and um, um, sort of the genome-wide genetic constraints on hybridization and how um, the location and number of hybrid incompatibilities might play into this. Um, and one thing that I've come to appreciate in, in working on wild populations of sore tails is how much the sort of non-genetic mechanisms um, are important. And this is something that perhaps I reluctantly have, have come to terms with as someone who, who is really interested in genetic interactions. Um, and this has been really apparent in our, our studies of, of trying to understand population structure in this particular hybrid population. Um, so one of, one of the things that we noticed as soon as we started doing ancestry typing in, in our, the natural hybrids was that we had this very strange population where we had a bimodal um, structure of ancestry. Um, so we had these hybrids that were 
uh, about 75% birch pinai, about 25% Malinche. And then we have this second ancestry type. And this um, was actually, um, even though it kind of looks pure Malinche, it has about, all these individuals have about 5 to 10% of their genome derived from birch pinai. Um, so this suggests that um, there's some, um, some kind of um, mechanism here that's generating isolation between these two subpopulations. And um, as we were sort of trying to understand this and dig it into the, the literature on this, there are a couple of different mechanisms that can cause this. So one is um, very strong selection, in fact, like close to 100% selection on the offspring between um, two species or two subpopulations. Um, another is very strong spatial segregation between these, these types, so perhaps some ecological isolation that we're not recognizing. And finally, um, sexual selection um, and assortative mating can generate these kinds of patterns, but it has to be extremely strong. Um, so one of the uh, first things we did in, in trying to understand this data was actually round up collections from museums, from collaborators that have been working on these populations for some time, and ask if this is consistent over the last several generations. And we were able to get data um, at the time from about 25 generations, now we have closer to 30. And what you can see is that these two clusters of ancestry are present even in uh, the earliest collections we have from these populations. So starting in 2003, uh, the early samples we had. Um, so overall spanning about 30 generations of population evolution. Um, and one of the things we were able to see in these historical collections that we didn't see in our sort of present day samples um, was evidence of individuals that were formed between mating events, uh, from mating events between these two clusters. So these individuals here are consistent with being either first generation offspring between the clusters or back crosses with this cluster. Um, and so this suggests um, uh, sort of what's evident already just looking at the present day data, there's some very strong barrier um, that in general prevents these kinds of mating events. Um, so we wanted to ask, especially given that we have this time series data and, and information about ancestry change over time, um, what migration rates between these subpopulations were consistent with our data? Um, and so um, given that we have this nice sort of ability to historically ground our simulations in our 2003 data, we're able to do ABC simulations um, asking specifically what migration rates are consistent with the data that we see today. Um, and I'm happy to talk in more detail about the methods of that if, if people are interested. Um, but what we see in, um, in the posterior <coughs> distributions from those simulations is that sort of as expected, um, in both directions, um, very few individuals uh, appear to be migrating each generation. So that the data that we see in, in um, 2015 and 2017 are consistent with only a few individuals exchanging genes between those, those clusters every generation. Um, so from there, we wanted to dive into the possible causes of this. Um, so I was pretty convinced that this was likely to be some kind of spatial substructure. Um, you have this population that's more like Birchman, this population that's more like Malinche, perhaps they're ecologically segregating. Um, and was surprised to find that um, indeed, like in, in very small spatial scales, we sample both subpopulations. Um, and that we've actually even been able to push this a little further. We can take underwater videos at these sites, and we can't distinguish male and female, uh, we can't distinguish the females of each cluster. But the males, we can predict their ancestry based on their secondary sexual characteristics um, with high accuracy. And so we can see from, um, from these videos that at least males of the two clusters are coexisting, courting, fighting in the same spaces, which really suggests to a sort of um, co-localization of the two populations. Um, we also um, took these individuals into the lab um, and we're able to cross them and produce a viable and fertile offspring. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that there isn't strong ecological selection against them in the wild, um, but it uh, does make it sort of curious that we see no intermediate ancestry individuals in most years. Um, and so we, we sort of turned um, to this final hypothesis that 
perhaps there are strong assorted of mating by ancestry in this population that is sort of structuring the, the population overall. And so the approach that we use to look at this is something that's sort of unique to the biology of the sword tail system. Um, so sword tails are live bearers, which means that um, they're essentially mammals. And if you collect um, a female sword tail, you're collecting about 30 of her offspring also. And, um, and on average, that reflects three to five mating events. And so what we, we said to do was to ancestry type wild caught females and also her offspring and ask about the difference in ancestry between the mothers and their offspring. Um, so just to walk you through this intuition, if a female mates with a male in her own ancestry cluster, she and her offspring will have very low ancestry differences genome wide. Um, however, if she mates with a male in a different cluster, you have this huge ancestry difference, and that's going to be reflected in the ancestry of her offspring. Um, on average, we expect about 25, 30% difference in ancestry in these cross cluster <coughs> mating events. And so um, we typed about 30 females, um, or 30 uh, females and, and mating events. And I'm gonna sh just sort of walk you through this figure. So on the x-axis is the maternal ancestry. So you can see that when we sampled mothers, we again get these two subpopulations that we see in the overall data. Um, but then on the y-axis um, is the difference between mothers and offspring in their ancestry. And what you see is that every single individual that we collected clusters right around zero. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, <coughs> almost no ancestry differences between mothers and their offspring. And by contrast, um, if we look at what's expected from just a single generation of random mating, those ancestries are shown here in, in the blue. Um, so this suggests um, the presence of very strong assorted mating, structuring um, the, or sort of perhaps either maintaining or, or driving this population structure that we see in natural populations. Um, so we were um, very curious about this. Um, uh, Thinking also from a, a sexual selection perspective, there's a lot known um, in work driven by my um, PhD co-advisor and, and current collaborator, Gil Rosenthal, about the dynamics of mate preferences in these species. And in particular, um, olfactory cues seem to be very important in, um, in recognizing and mating with conspecifics. So we reason that perhaps those might be important cues in these natural hybrid populations. Um, and so um, all of our work on this river has really focused on sort of fairly unimpacted regions of the river um, where there isn't a lot of human development or human use of the river um, for obvious reasons. Um, but we thought that for, for these um, structured populations, so we, um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this already, but we actually see population structure of a pretty broad stretch of the river. Um, and it's, it's quite consistent. I'll show you that in a moment. Um, but then um, the river starts to run through a town. And at that point, um, we see a lot of use of the river, people doing laundry, um, um, there's a lot higher turbidity, um, and we know there's um, quite a lot of agricultural runoff in, in these areas. So um, we thought that if, in particular, this might be an olfactory mediated um, mechanism of um, assortative mating, that we might see a change in the population structure as we go down the river into these more impacted sites. And so I'm gonna show you some data on this, but um, we're quite early in this process of understanding this, so I'm um, excited to hear any thoughts or suggestions. Um, so again, as I said, um, in our high elevation sites, in these um, fairly unimpacted regions, we see this really stark population structure. Um, but as we get into these populated areas, actually the first site, um, that occurs after, um, collection site that occurs after the river begins to flow through the town, we start to see these intermediate ancestry individuals. And as you go to lower and lower elevations, you see almost complete collapse of this population structure. Um, so we're currently um, working on, on getting detailed measures of water quality and trying to possibly tease apart some of the different um, environmental mechanisms that might be sort of interplaying with, um, with possible mate preference mechanisms that could then result in the breakdown of 
population structure. But as I said, we're, we're quite early in understanding the, the environmental drivers here, although the genetic patterns are very striking. Um, one of the things we do know is um, that um, we can look sort of directly at mate choice decisions using these genetic tools. Um, and so I showed you earlier in these structured populations, we have um, extremely low difference between mothers and offspring in their ancestry compared to null expectations of random mating. Um, but if we look in some of these collapsed populations, we actually see that the difference between mothers and, and offspring in their ancestry closely coincides with what you would expect from just random mating. Um, so this has all been really exciting and, and um, has been an education for me and how important thinking about you know, what's going on in the population level is for understanding the way that these genomes and populations are, are going to evolve. Um, and one of the things that I, um, I'll um, end with, which I think is a sort of interesting connection between these different processes, is this idea um, that hybrid incompatibilities will, are predicted to fix for the major ancestry over time. Um, so depending on if you start off towards parent one, you'll fix for parent one. If you start off towards parent two, you'll fix for parent two. Um, and in these structured populations then, we might predict um, that these two subpopulations will sort of, um, uh, sort of um, go back to parental types in terms of their incompatibility phenotypes. So we might expect this population to look a lot like Malinche in terms of its genotypes at hybrid incompatibility loci, and this population to look a lot like Birchmanai. Um, and so this then suggests that if you have collapse of population structure, if these populations have stabilized, you might be sort of re-exposing some of the parental incompatibilities. Um, and this is, a, I think, a really exciting idea that we have the sort of biological resources to look at, given that we've mapped a lot of incompatibilities and we have these sort of unstructured or um, breakdown in population structure samples. Um, and we're, um, we're looking at this sort of more genome-wide, um, but one of the things that's, that's really exciting is when you cross the parental species, one of the incompatibilities that you uncover is a melanoma that occurs only in hybrid. Um, and that's what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. And um, one of uh, the first phenotypes that we saw as we were pulling individuals out of these lower elevation populations was hybrids with really aggressive melanoma, which we don't see in our more stabilized hybrid populations. So I'm really excited about this idea that there's sort of you know, many layers of, of the way that selection occurs on hybrids. Um, and, you know, that these consequences of hybrid, hybridization can have reverberations over many generations. And this is a question that is not just at, you know, a single loci, but we can ask genome-wide. And quite interestingly, there, there may be um, some feedback between these processes, such that as subpopulations stabilize for incompatibility phenotypes, that may um, sort of act in a way, or as a reinforcing mechanism to prevent hybridization and promote assortative mating. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Um, in the first part of my talk, I told you about our work trying to understand the interplay between hybrid incompatibilities and the way that genomes stabilize um, and the important relationship with the combination rate. And in the second part of my talk, I told you about the importance of assortative mating and shaping the way these hybrid populations are evolving. Um, and I think we have a lot to do to understand the hybrid genome, um, but it's a question of central importance as we start to um, understand that, that many genomes we study are advanced. Um, and I think um, amazing inventors and, and collaborators, including uh, people who are coming in my lab and, and we need some of this work. Somebody could get the lights in the back. I'm sure Molly would be happy to, to take questions. Uh, so you talked about how um, in these wild populations there's just so much going on that it can be difficult to tease it apart from sort of the classical genetics um, mechanisms. What are some of the benefits of studying all of this in a natural population? So I think there are a lot uh, in my perspective, obviously I'm biased. Um, so in natural populations, you see the selection that's happening in the wild, right? And, um, you know, and, and we see that in, in the types of selection coefficients we're inferring for some of these loci. They're, they're 
what you would call weak in a lab mapping population <coughs> selection coefficients of around 0 0.05 or even lower. Um, but obviously those are super deterministic in a real population. And so, you know, by studying the, the natural populations, we have an ability to look at a sort of space that we wouldn't be able to look at. And we've done sort of a, I was mentioning earlier to someone, um, a sort of bad job of looking at this in general, but of course there's a huge amount of ecological selection going on in the wild populations that we're just starting to try to characterize and understand at the genetic level too. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to understand the, the spatial context yeah. of this. So if you were at this river system, mm -hmm. I'm kind of sort of curious about what the linear distance is between the parentals and what happens if you were to sample all the way down the stream. I mean, because it seems like the hybrid population, so they're not really, I mean, at some point they must be meeting with the 100% parental populations on either end. Yeah, so they meet with um, with the Malinche or sorry, they meet with the Birchfine parent, but the Malinche parent, there are all these waterfalls. So those are very strong barriers. And we have we have two full climbs of two of these rivers. Um, and you see those geographical barriers really clearly. Um, and then, you know, um, so actually, you know, many of our source populations for Birchfine are allopatric populations that have gotten sort of cut off from the main river system because we see integration all the way down the river in, in most of our populations that are interconnected. Uh, so if you're sampling the area that has the hybrids, that's yeah. basically just a hybrid population yeah, that's so, isolated from the parentals on either end, or virtually so. Right, yeah. And you do see variation as you go along that climb in, in mixture proportion, but it's quite there's quite a sharp drop-off. Um, so, yeah. Um, this builds right off of what you're asking, I think. But So if you have the dating of those hybrid populations to be like 50 or so generations, mm -hmm. like. Do you have any ecological information from back then to be like, what happened? Are those waterfalls just like, I don't know, oh, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, what was the initial so, kind of cause for hybridization? Yeah, so actually we have one river um, that we've just done some extensive sampling of where there's no admixture. Um, so we don't know what things were like 50 generations ago, um, but we can sort of look at this river and you know make some assumptions that it, it reflects what might have been going on in the other rivers before hybridization. What we see in that river is that the parental species are or have like a very narrow range of overlap um, at intermediate elevations, um, and um, but it's sort of in a region where they're both low density um, because they're thermally limited um, and they don't do very well in the other's thermal environment. So um, we imagine that hybridization began in those kinds of populations and then sort of maybe spread out from there. Um, but again, we're in a space where we don't really know very much. You might have mentioned this, but um, are you trying to map these sorts of mating loci? We are not because um, we've found, we've, we have a very hard time with repeatability in our asserted mate, or in our mate preference assay. So you, know, you see population level repeatability, but in terms of individual repeatability, it's very poor, especially for the hybrid. Um, and I don't know if that's like, you know, like uh, something biological or, or, you know, limitations of our assays, but basically <coughs> at this point we think our uh, variance introduced by phenotyping is too large to be able to do this kind of thing. Um, but yeah, that's obviously something we would love to do. Um, so the highland and intermediate populations are isolated in each, each stream drainage. Uh, what about the lowland populations? Are they isolated from one another? And then the thought, kind of a second question. Stream capture is especially common at high elevations. Yeah. Is there any evidence of stream capture in the systems you're working in? Yeah, so the low elevation populations are connected to each other. And we actually view that as a good thing because it makes them sort of more genetically homogenous, um, which, you know, is important for saying that, you know, the hybridization events that are happening in the different rivers are sort of between the same kinds of genomes. Um, the high elevation populations, I, I hadn't realized that stream capture was common at high elevations. Um, they are also extremely similar in ways that is sort of confusing to me because that population, so they're in a very challenging habitat. They're the highest elevation um, species in, swordtail species in Mexico. And they, um, 
have extremely low effective population sizes. So it's uh, about sort of the, the comparison between humans and Neanderthals, so almost, almost 10 times lower. And so um, that would mean that we would expect, if they've been isolated at all, um, really strong genetic differences between the source Malinche populations, which we do not see. Um, so that does suggest some connection between them, um, either sort of through underground or, or through other mechanisms. Um, and we've always found that very puzzling. Sure. Uh, yeah, awesome talk. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, the species are relatively old, like half a million years. I mean, do you think that, that genetic drift is actually sort of causing these genetic incompatibilities to build up over time, or is it divergent selection? <coughs> I think this is something we know almost nothing about, like in general, <laughs> um, but is extremely important, especially because these different mechanisms, so like a drift-based mechanism for the buildup of incompatibilities results in different dynamics in hybrids than a selection-based mechanism. Um, the fitness matrices are that sort of compatible genotypes are, are different. Um, and so this is something that like we really have to know, but like don't know in any case that, or in most cases. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in both cases, so in Bershaw and Malinche, we have this really strong ecological divergence that accompanies a speciation event that may have been important in, in some of the fixation we see. But we also have this just sort of genome-wide, I mean, FST is just like super high across the genome. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, I, I was thinking of this idea of genomic niche, which is a, just the old-fashioned view of adaptation. You get adaptation here and here, and then you get different species and they don't mix, you know, as you pointed out, oh, that's really not how it works as far as the admixture goes. But I'm wondering about the tendency for uh, admix populations then, and you showed what happens in a variety of circumstances, the tendency to rush back to their designed, their designed place, and so that it's some of them may be, you know, genetically incompatible and so on, but it's also they aren't as well designed, you know. Uh, do Neanderthal speak? Let's ignore that and say they don't. And so that, oh, it'd be better just to, you know, go mate with the Neanderthals if I'm a non-speaker, whereas go to these damn humans if I am. I'm just trying to generalize that to your observations with your uh, Mexican populations of uh, What's the role of old-fashioned adaptation in your scheme, I guess, is, my, is another way of uh, putting that question. Yeah, so I think, so there's really strong thermal limitations in this system. So there are genetic differences between the two species, and there are probably a lot of ecological selection pressures that we don't know about. Um, but we know from crosses in the lab that the, so the two species have about a, eight degree difference in their thermal maxima, with Molinche having a, a much lower um, tolerance. And when you generate F1 and F2 crosses in the lab, um, F1s have intermediate tolerance, um, everybody raised in the same environment, and F2s actually begin to segregate um, for the parental tolerances. So I imagine that the, the thermal selection is gonna be a really strong thing. How that interacts with selection and incompatibilities and what's more important, I don't have uh, opinion on yet, um, but maybe I will someday as we as we make more progress on mapping these and, and tracking them in the hybrid populations. Um, but I think you know one of the shortcomings of our, our work in the system is that you know we haven't really characterized the the likely myriad ecological differences between these species, and of course that's going to interplay. You know the locations of the loci underlying them is going to interplay with selection and incompatibilities, interplay with sexual selection, um, and I think that's sort of one of the challenges of studying hybridization is that there are many levels of things going on, and we need to understand all of these models and how they interact. Well, if there are no more questions, let's thank Molly once again for a great talk.